Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. I hope everyone that wanted to was able to get out and enjoy the eclipse on Monday. As you can imagine, we've all that's all we've been talking about here during the uh, pre-show meeting is uh, the experiences that we all had. So, and I had missed out on the 2017 eclipse, so I was thrilled to be able to see this one. Um, and even though the weather wasn't uh, quite as cooperative as I would have liked, um, it was still just awesome. So um, we got another great show for you tonight. Uh, Claire Bradshaw is joining us all the way from the UK where it's uh, 2.30 in the morning. So uh, Claire's going to talk to us about how she got into astrophotography and uh, how, to, how she learned how to make the uh, amazing images like the ones you can see on her Instagram and her, her YouTube channel. Um, but before we get to Claire's presentation, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we're off again next week for uh, uh, NEF and, and the NEAC conference. So no show next week. And then we'll be back on April 28th with the second half of Kai Young's presentation about the Sea Star. Uh, C-Star 50, uh, his first talk that he gave a couple of months ago was has been really popular, uh, and I know he's got even more interesting information lined up for, for the next show. So, uh, like I said, no show next week, but be back on the 28th for uh, more about the C-Star. Uh, so, Claire, are you ready to take over? Yeah. <laughs> All yeah, right. Uh, but... <laughs> you can stay awake. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I believe in you. Oh. Okay, you I'll can start. do it. Okay, I'll um, present and so I'll screen and away we go. Okay, let me know when everything's good and everything like that. Yep, Looks good. good. Excellent. Um, Oh, hi everyone. Yeah, I am Claire Bradshaw. I am uh, Astronomy with Claire on online and various socials and all that jazz. Um, as I said, here it is um, 0233 in the morning. And as I was saying earlier, what does the O stand for? Oh my gosh, it's early. Um, so this is my uh, little presentation about how I got into astrophotography. And I'm going to cover sort of three main areas. So I'm going to do a bit of Universe uh, 101, uh, which allows me to show some of my photographs, which is always a good thing. And covering some very basic topics, but it gives me a grounding into sh sort of further topics a little bit later along the line. Then going into the actual astrophotography itself, how I how I do that, how I um, how I create these images, and then. For me personally, when I you know look at the night sky when I take these pictures, I don't have a disconnect between what I am seeing and myself. And I, I, what I want to do with the last part is to bring all of this back together as to how the universe itself is connected with us uh, in in a very fundamental way that a lot of people don't sometimes don't realise that there is this fundamental connection. So. With with all of that, away we go. So, um, a bit of an introduction. So, I've loved space all my life, and and I've been influenced by a lot of popular culture, and just love standing at the back garden and looking up the stars where where I lived. And um, I I science excites me. It's always excited me. And I I took um, what's in the UK as GCSE physics which is, I don't know what level that is, um, at the same the US level, but it is um, way before university. So it was a basic sort of physics. I loved it, but maths um, hated me. Um, it really did, but that didn't seem to matter at that sort of level. So I decided to take um, A-level physics um, and, you know, that much more advanced level and uh, et cetera. But I find it was extremely hard and I came away with a U simply because the maths was super, super difficult. Um, but I found that, you know, I was never going to be an academic in, in this field, but I, I found that I, I had an, an easy way of being able to give, communicate difficult subjects into stuff that people could understood. So that is my my main career. So I'm an e-learning developer and um, 
this is how I then take subjects from in um, astronomy, astrophotography, and convert it in a way that people can understand. So, how do I link uh, what is up there to what is down here? Um, that so there is an intrinsic link between what is up there and down here, and we sometimes we as astronomers or astrophotographers get quite focused on what it is that we're seeing without you know clicking about this link, um, and um, I, I, you know, that there is this intrinsic link, so that that's what I'm going to be covering as we as we go along. So back to basics, universe 101. So what I'm going to do is kind of whiz through this bit because I'm going to, with every audience that I talk to, from school children right up to to adults, um, and the adults of different sort of uh, say societies, like astronomy societies and things like that. I have to sort of take a pinch of salt as to who I'm talking to and um, so some of this may seem pretty much teaching granny to suck eggs. There's a bit of a Britishism for you there. Um, but it's to get some grounding in some of the numbers and everything that we're going to be looking at later. Um, so excuse the voice, because <laughs> this is my early morning voice. Um, OK, all right, here we go. So the concept of a light year. Um, a lot of people say about the light year is that it, it is purely to do with light, visible light that we can see, whereas in actual fact it's talking about the entire electromagnetic spectrum um, and everything from radio waves with their vast gaps in between peaks to gamma rays in with their tiny little peaks, everything travels at exactly the same speed, that, that um, vast speeds that they cover, which um, 186,000 miles per second. And these numbers are just, they, they, they seem to um, really sort of mind boggling the 671 million miles an hour, 16 billion miles a day, and 5.88 trillion miles a year. Um, because when I talk to people about light years, um, about how fast something is away, like, you know, it's only, it's only four, four light years away, but it's four times 5.88 trillion miles. Um, and then people start to get a real sense of the distances between things and the, the wow factor for that. Um, so I'm going to cover some real big things and then crunch down to some very basic things for this universe 101. But um, so a lot of this stuff is going to be fairly basic to most. So looking at galaxies, and there are a variety of different types of galaxies, the um, the, the, the spiral shapes, the um, uh, round uh, shapes, the barred shapes, and even um, one that looks like a, a sombrero hat. Now, when it comes, astronomers are um, often quite, uh, when they find things, they um, they name them after things that they, uh, what they remind them of. And in, in this instance, the uh, sombrero hat galaxy is very much that. Um, and that happens through all of the photographs that I have taken, that every single object has uh, an, a name associated with it, which amuses a lot of people when they when they find out about that. Um, so looking at this, this picture was taken with from Horsham in, in, in West Sussex in, in the UK. Um, and Horsham is a fairly typical town um, surrounded by light pollution. Our second biggest international airport is nearby and um, surrounded by floodlights and, and, and stuff like that. So um, yeah, we I'm lucky to get this little slither of dark sky outside the back of my house. But um, the Andromeda galaxy, it's uh, two and a half million light years away, which means that um, to get to the light from that, to our galaxy and, and our home in that galaxy, um, it took two and a half million years to set off, and that those sort of numbers are mind-boggling. Um, that the, the light in this picture is two and a half million years old, which is always um, absolutely amazing when when you think about it. Um, so the uh, Triangulum Galaxy is another nearby galaxy, one of our local group. Um, contains three, four billion stars. But the main thing about this is these sort of pink areas that you can see within this galaxy, which are enormous um, star production areas, giant nebula within inside that galaxy. Um, that, that's uh, amazing to see. Uh, 
So going into smaller things like uh, nebula, our, our dim patches of gas that glow because of new stars that are forming within inside them, including two that are um, enormous, 400,000, 450,000 times brighter than the sun, 50 and 60 thousand, 50 and 60 times more massive than our own sun, which is enormous as is. Um, so yeah, basically say no are, are, the, are these massive star forming regions. Um, the California Nebula. So, and that, this is one of these ones that's um, again so named, um, and is is a region of uh, active uh, glowing gas caused by the radiation coming from this nearby star, and then the gas can't keep hold of it and um, emits that uh, as light. Apparently, it looks like California. I don't really know if it does or not. Um, I'm not sure how they got to that. But yeah, um, the California Nebula, which is a, a beautiful sight to see. Um, another one is at the other end of the scale, the uh, popped balloon nebula. Of course, it looks like a popped balloon. And um, it's a supernova remnant from um, uh, when a star died many, many years ago. Uh, it's 10,000 light years away and 100 light years across. So. 100 light years may not seem a lot when you times 100 by 5.88 trillion miles to get a sense of scale of how big these things really are in, our, in the night sky. And in the background, you can see that there is not only an infinitesimal number of stars, there's also a scattering of so much hydrogen in the night sky um, to show that hydrogen is just everywhere um, in our universe. Two of the, the best ones I love are the, are the Flame and the Horsehead Nebula. Of course, they're going to be called the Flame and the Horsehead Nebula because that's exactly what it is that they look like. Um, a nice chess piece, um, horse shape, and the flame sort of shape with um, the distinctive sort of gas trails um, causing that, uh, that uh, effect. And the, the, uh, the effect here is simply because the gas is glowing in the background, um, and there is that gas and dust that is uh, cold and dark in between us to cause this this effect. Um, but yeah, they they're, they're absolutely uh, are beautiful, and I, I love them a lot. Um, okay, so again, basic uh, one hundred and one um, uh, stars are superheated. Um, uh, gas held together by their own gravity, and uh, gravity is in this constant battle with with the star over billions of years, trying to squash it down. Whereas um, the uh, nuclear fusion is constantly pushing it out in all directions to keep this shape. And this happens, you know, occurs over over billions and billions of years. Um, and um, in a, a given picture that you can take, you can see uh, newer stars. Uh, because of their colour, sort of at one end of the spectrum, whereas older stars are redder coloured. So even just by just giving a, a complete snap of the night sky, you can tell at these different ages of stars just simply um, just by looking at them. Um, again, I use this as a test when I'm talking to school children to say, right, okay, uh, what are we looking at? Are these new or um, uh, older stars? You know, Vega and Sirius are. are Recently, new stars was now. I have to go with the name here: Battle Guys to some, or Beetlejuice to others. Um, but you're not allowed to say that name more than three times, otherwise Michael Keaton might show up. So we're going to say Battle Guys um, as the, as the name for it. Uh, it is this very old star that hopefully at some point in our lives we will see go supernova because it is literally at the end of its life a giant red star. Um, although if it went supernova now, which would be brilliant, we wouldn't know about it for about 640 years because that's how far it is away, 640 light years and uh, it's, it will just take that long for the light to arrive. So, But if it happened 640 years ago, we would find about it you know, pretty sharpish. Uh, newborn stars, uh, and as I said, looking at before was, was glowing uh, um, 
emission nebula. These are um, uh, reflection nebula where um, the stars are not powerful enough to cause the hydrogen to emit at the red end of the wavelength. So uh, they reflect the starlight coming from these very new baby stars that are only 120 um, million years old. So put them even sort of younger than the dinosaurs, which is, which is fantastic. Again, this is being careful, little guys. Um, this super red giant on, uh, on the shoulder of Orion, uh, at the end of its life, it's it's the end. I mean, it's very very soon at any point, it's going to be coming to end of its life as, as and turn into a supernova, which is something that we'll get to right at the end. So this is an actual star in that process, ready to go. Um, and yeah, okay, so. Deep sky astrophotography, how is it done? How am I taking those photographs? How do I get through that process? Um, checking the time, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, and um, yeah, so how do, I, how do I take these photographs? So going through the process of um, how this is done, setting up the equipment and getting those photographs from, of, things up in the night sky, up onto the screen that you just uh, saw. First thing of all, polar alignment. Why is it fundamental to astrophotography? Well, a bit of uh, maths for you here, which I, which I hate, but um, here we go. Uh, one day is 24 hours. Uh, so in 24 hours, the Earth rotates 360 degrees. One hour is 15 degrees. One minute is 0.25 degrees and one second is 0.042 degrees. Now that may not seem a lot, but when you are a, an object on that ball that is rotating, the stars in the distance will be um, uh, moving at that rate. And if you're not static and fixed, looking at those stars, you're gonna get blurs uh, very, very, very quickly. And that is the reason why this is important. So this, the Rosette Nebula that I showed before is 85 five minute exposures taken over three days. And in order to get this perfectly aligned shot, uh, you first of all have to be polar aligned um, on every single setup. So how do we go through that polar alignment? Well, um, as I asked the uh, others and school kids, which way is, which way is north, which way is up? And so up is always like that. Well, yeah, no. Um, north celestial pole is actually tipped at that angle. We can tell when we take long exposures of the night sky, we see um, that angular tip and uh, of 23 and a half degrees. And Polaris is the star that barely seems to move in that rotation uh, because the Earth is rotating around that point. So what we need to do is polar align the telescope in that direction. So this is my mount, my setup, uh, a refractor, and we face that uh, roughly to the north. And uh, the little camera I have on the front, little pole master, uh, points at Polaris. And on the screen, this gives me this picture of the stars surrounding Polaris and Polaris itself identifies that, instructs me to rotate the mount about about 90 degrees because um, it needs to get Polaris to here. So here we go, um, it rotates it around, gets to Polaris to there, and then I use uh, little um, knobs and, and, and uh, 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 twisting devices at the front of the mount to get the head pointing perfectly at Polaris, and therefore we are polar aligned. The mount, when it is rotating, is now going to be rotating at the same angle that the Earth is tilted at in space, which is fundamentally important when it comes to astrophotography. So the next part is uh, plate solving, a target, uh, find your target and then plate solving, or what we, I call, hello, it's 4291. And this is a slight um, in-joke, for people in the UK as to find out what, you know, where do you remember 4291 from? Well, if you've ever seen Victor Meldrew on One Foot in the Grave, um, it is uh, the telephone number that he uses, but that's probably an in-joke inside our, inside our shores. Um, 
So we have the Rosette Nebula. And this has a, an, a um, specific right ascension declination in space that uh, is known as, as its address, essentially. And this can be fed into our mount and the mount will move to that position and then it'll start taking um, uh, uh, 10 second exposures through the software that I use uh, in order to, to create this process, uh, which we'll come to in a sec. So it starts taking 10 second exposures and um, looking at the night sky. And then it will work out what the right ascension and declination is of those stars. And it will see that there is a difference between the two. And it says, well, this object that you want to look at, you're off by this amount. So you're off by six minutes, 23 seconds, and off by 904 declination. So it then uses that to um, work out actually where we should be pointing and realigns the telescope to point at the actual object. Plate solving has been a, a lifesaver for me and for a lot of astrophotographers where before it used to be just dialing in yourself into the telescope mount or even just using the handset and then doing star alignment, etc. And it was basically, you end up getting to the point of outside with your telescope and freezing and wondering, why did I get into the subject after all, not do something in the warm? Um, uh, but plate solving is 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 perfect, perfect uh, invention for for this subject. So we get to actually point at our object. From this point onwards, um, we're going to be talking about uh, color cameras. So when I originally put this presentation together, it was talking about my one shot color camera that I use the twenty six C from Auto Astro, whereas I also now own a mono camera. Um, the difference being that very quickly, the uh, uh, image processing chip is split into uh, 26 million pixels and it's part, each part of those is divided into four using one red, one blue and two parts green uh, to enable to image uh, the, the night sky. And any color that you pass to those pixels uh, only you say it was in red part of the spectrum, only a quarter of it would pick up on, on the red, a quarter pick up in blue and uh, two quarters or half as it's normally known as um, in green. Whereas the mono camera, every part of the pixel reacts to the red, every part of the pixel reacts to blue if you put a particular filter in front of it. So, but what we're gonna be talking about is one shot color cameras from this point onwards. Um, so, our sequence that we set up, um, we, uh, I use a piece of software called Nina Nighttime Imaging and Astronomy. Uh, they've managed to wedge the N in there somewhere. And um, it is, uh, I set up 50 lights, 50 photographs, and uh, each of them 300 seconds long. And uh, that equals about four hours or 10 minutes of data of filter number one. So the thing is about astrophotography is that you get to realize that these things are going to take, these photographs are going to take you a long time to get all this data in. So um, typical British weather is never one, you know, one piece from one hour to the next. So you're, you know, you're dodging clouds, you're going to be dodging uh, wind and rain and uh, you may not get this necessarily this four hours in all at once. Uh, it may be spread over a week. It may be spread over, you know, uh, different parts of an evening, et cetera. But roughly, say, if you're going to take 50 lights, that's going to be four hours of filter number one. And then you set up another sequence of four hours and 10 minutes of filter number two. So getting all your data is going to take a long, long time. Um, but it's necessary for which we come to in a second. In my uh, telescope, in my telescope, there are um, uh, there's a filter wheel, and I have three primary filters: um, a four nanometer hydrogen alpha oxygen three filter, four nanometer sulfur two oxygen three, and an L Pro Max. Uh, light pollution slash galaxy slash reflection nebula filter. And these are essentially ways of blocking out different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we saw before. So 
coming back to this again, the electromagnetic spectrum that we was looking at, uh, we see within the visible spectrum, and unfortunately things like street lights and um, international airports and your neighbor's uh, sort of spotlight that you used to light up their back garden, all transmit within this whole uh, area of visible light. Otherwise it'd be pretty pointless if they transmitted in, um, you know, and pretty dangerous as well, uh, if they transmitted at other ends of this spectrum. Um, but uh, the hydrogen alpha, which is from uh, re reflection nebulas that transmit in hydrogen alpha and then also oxygen three are also within inside this spectrum area here. So um, the filter that I use or filters that I use, I have this blocking range of 700 uh, nanometers, 380 nanometers, and they help to filter out this light. And essentially what happens is, is that uh, the light comes into the telescope and goes through the filter and out pops the other side, uh, our lovely bits of data uh, are completely filtered out. And the more filtering it does, the narrower the band of light that it collects, the more expensive the filter is, which is brilliant. Um, but these uh, filters, these narrow band filters, help to cut out as much light pollution as possible, which is which is brilliant um, for collecting all of that light and data. So the next thing that we look at, so as you can see, this is a long drawn out process of getting these photographs. Uh, it's, it's a dedicated um, art. And uh, the next thing you're talking about is jitter. Any manufactured, human manufactured component is never uh, the same from one piece on the production line to another. Mounts that are built to, to exactly the same standard from mount to mount to mount to mount to mount are going to have slightly different gearing, slightly different amounts of dirt and dust and, and grease and things like that um, on those cogs. And so they are going to produce errors and that a periodic error after about 60 seconds is gonna cause, cause drift uh, in your scope. And when you're taking a five minute long exposure, as we saw before, you're not going to want drift after 60 seconds because essentially that's going to create a horrible image just like this. So you have to guide the scope into um, correctly uh, keeping aligned with those stars. And how do we do that? Well, we use a guide scope um, as a, guide, a little tiny little telescope with a, um, a little camera on the end. And what it does is that it watches for a particular star and it is trained as to the errors that the um, telescope does. So as its telescope is happily tracking away and it has all these tiny little errors, the software watches using the telescope and this little camera, a particular star, and it watches for the errors that's happening, too much left, too much right, a bit up, a bit down. And it says, all right, I can now start to predict the errors that, that are happening because of your mount. And then it produces a, a, a basically, a, a opposite push direction. So if it's drifting a little bit to the left, it'll push them out a little bit to the right. And if it's going a little bit too much up, it will push it a little bit far, too much down. So this graph shows the errors that are happening uh, and the opposite um, reactions to that to keep the mount perfectly tracking our object as we go along. So it becomes uh, a guided. And the next part of that is autofocus. The human hand, I don't know if you've ever tried to um, focus a star or an object in the telescope and then your, you know, your hand is trying to do it and it, you're, you're sort of wobbling the telescope with the tiniest amount of touch, which is very annoying. Um, you know, it's you know, curse my hands for being so wobbly. Uh, the autofocus simply does it on a such a macro meter scale that is impossible for human hands. And it, what it does is that it, uh, the software measures the, uh, the size of the stars. And then every five seconds, it's, taken a, it's doing a movement and a, a, um, a, another photograph. And it keeps on going, so out of focus, uh, and it's, the stars are getting bigger, so it knows that that is very much wrong. And it keeps on going until it gets to a point where the stars are at their smallest width and then it knows that they are in focus. And it's, thank you very much, innovation and um, automation. I, I am very happy with that, uh, away you go.
So this is a hydrogen alpha example, uh, and while well, we're taking the shot. So taking the shot, this, this is the process that we go through. A, a five second photograph doesn't get us a lot of data. Um, so we have to take these five minutes sort of long photographs or longer exposures, depending on the object that you're taking a photograph of. But nebula are usually, as, as we said before, are very, very dim. So we have to do things like five minute photographs, uh, which are great, but then they're, they're noisy. Uh, and noise is not um, uh, audio noise, but it's visual noise. So just one photograph is, is not in, you know, good enough. Uh, we need to take multiples, but by taking multiples, then we sort of we try, end up getting noise into our pictures, and we have to get rid of this noise. There's different types of noise, um, which everyone will be happy to hear. Uh, there is uh, we use calibration files to get rid of them. So first of all, we take uh, somewhere between say 50 200 lights uh, of hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. The more photographs we have we have a better signal to noise ratio so that the software, when it comes to uh, stacking these images, can see that there is things that are the same throughout the picture, the nebula itself or the, the stars, but the noise in the background uh, changes from picture to picture and can be eliminated. And the more pictures that we have, the, uh, the more data software has got to work on to eliminate that noise because you can see it changes radically from picture to picture to picture compared to the nebula or the galaxy itself. Uh, we also need flats and we take about 20 of those and the flats are, our, our telescopes are not dust free, our, um, our filters and uh, camera chips etc are never going to be dust free and because it's a telescope Great. Um, any dust and everything of that lot on this it gets magnified in size and um, ends up being as what is called as dust bunnies on the photographs, as horrible sort of uh, dusty blobs, and um, which isn't great. The other thing uh, we take are darks. So the processing chip, 26 million pixels, for example, or more uh, or less. Um, not all of those pixels are going to be working correctly. And some may be dead pixels. A dead pixel may show up as red or as, as uh, all blue or even just white. And obviously we're taking photographs of distant stars, which are reds and whites and different sort of shades of those colors. Uh, and, and, and blues as well. And the last one we want is 40 pixels sort of messing up our photograph because how are we supposed to tell the difference between what is real and what is not because of these dead pixels. So we take these dark photographs by putting the cap over the front of the telescope and then taking several long exposures um, of about up to five minutes and to match our um, lights that we've taken to show any imperfections and issues in our imaging chip. And for, for a mono camera, so these are for the, the father one shot color camera, for the mono camera, I'll be taking uh, three times, uh, uh, you know, three amounts of light. So I'll be taking HA03 and S2 uh, images uh, to get all the data that I need. So mm, three times, you know, twice as much data, et cetera, oh, gosh. Um, so here is how I do my flats. So the mount points at Zenith, and then I put an LED panel over the top. And this is where you have to put your trust in uh, the laws of physics, because essentially you're asking a telescope that costs around about seven maybe yeah seven thousand pounds uh to point straight up at the uh night sky with a concrete base at the bottom and that everything has to work and not fall off because this thing is quite heavy and you put a, an led panel at the top that shines pure white light all the way through so that the camera can take photographs of any um dust that's inside your telescope but you're sort of standing there <laughs> please don't fall Please don't fall because I need to grab you and somehow beat that 10, minute, 10 meters per second per second and grab it before it, it hits the ground, which is probably going to be impossible. Um, so, yeah, you have to really put your um, make sure everything's tightened up 
uh, with all the bolts and everything before it goes into this zenith position. So we get our single five minute frame and this is all the noise. This is just a simulation of all of the noise that uh, we will get. We've got our, uh, our nebula in the, in the background, but we've got all this other junk that's in there as well. So we create a five minute photograph. So that adds to the sort of the data that we see of the nebula, but it also say it shows us all of this noise. So when the software comes to aligning all of these pictures together, um, it'll essentially uh, be able to work out what is noise and what isn't. So we stack and align our, our photographs. We feed all of the data into the, the alignment software, which takes all of our pictures, which are slightly off angle and slightly or slightly off uh, kilter, and then aligns them into a single stack, and then takes that stack and then compresses that into one uh, picture. Uh, sort of, if you like, looking at a, a cake from the side uh, and then takes all of that and puts it into, into one. But then we've still got all of these, um, these, these noisy data. So to, first of all, it takes the flat frames and takes that away from our, from our data. And then the dark frames are taken away to end up with our results. So we've taken multiple hours of data. We've dodged all of the clouds and the rain and uh, the, the wind and whatever weather that the British uh, weather seems to throw at us all the time. Uh, we've dodged all the satellites and the satellite trails and everything else out on the sun that doesn't set until goodness knows when uh, in the summer uh, to finally get our results. So nervous anticipation when the supercomputer next to you has spat out this picture and then, you know, it's all done. Like it? <laughs> so basically, um, you know, your, your software sort of says, right, after several hours of processing, bing, it comes up and like a toaster sort of, you know, showing you these pictures and it's like quite happily like, look what I've done. And you're like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> that was really worth the effort. Um, and essentially what it's done in the processing is the software doesn't know the difference between shadows, midtones, and highlights. It just puts all of the data into the shadows. It, it doesn't know what, what's, you know, what is good and what isn't good looking. It just processes the data and then all of the data ends up in the shadows of our histogram. So it is up to us as human beings. This is when our aesthetic eye comes in to look at these objects and to stretch the data slowly out of the shadows and uh, spread it across the midtones and the highlights. And that's where we get our stretched histogram. And then we end up with our result like so. So we've now got our stretched hydrogen alpha and stretched oxygen three image. Now I used to, this, this presentation was sort of done around about the time that I used to do everything in Photoshop. So uh, we're gonna do a couple of slides here where we're talking about how I used to do the processing in Photoshop. So um, when we're creating an RGB image, we um, assign red to hydrogen alpha and blue to oxygen three, but we're, we're missing an element in the middle, which is green. So we need to create a either a synthetic green channel which is used with a combination of the red and the blue, or we just simply use sulfur two data if you can be bothered to wait that extra uh, number of hours to get that. But um, typically I wasn't, I was just gathering the hydrogen alpha and the oxygen three, and then creating this synthetic green channel to combine it into our final result. And so finally, after all of these hours of gathering this data, setting up the scope, um, polar aligning, finding your objects, and all of this um, effort finally gets the result at the end. And you get, in this instance, the Crescent Nebula. So obviously, say as you see it, astronomers, when they see something, yeah, what does that remind me of? The Crescent Nebula. And then a little bit later on in time, people are like, well, actually, it looks like a Euro symbol. Um, 
which to most people around the world doesn't make any sense unless you're in Europe. So that's not much use. So yeah, the Crescent Nebula is a dying star, a wolf riot star. So it's in the process of dying and the outer edge shell is moving away, but the star is still giving off uh, a lot of um, uh, energy across the electromagnetic spectrum that's causing this um, envelope, this shell to, to glow. Um, there's a bit of a close-up pivot here. So we've got the outer shell, which is all the active hydrogen, which is leaking away from the central star, and this very thin veil of, of active uh, oxygen that is glowing from this leftover energy from, from the star, which, which yeah, looks amazing. Um, so a picture of the, uh, and as I, I, every time I do these presentations, okay, what is it we're we looking at here? And most of them guess correctly that it is the heart nebula because of its distinctive heart shape. Again, a, a rich area of uh, where new stars are, are forming uh, and are being born. And um, essentially uh, the uh, gaps in it are where, you know, the hydrogen has been used up to form these new stars and it's glowing brightly because of these brand new baby stars in the middle. The Veil Nebula at the other end of the uh, scale is a part of an enormous uh, structure of a supernova that happened between 20 and 30,000 years ago and it is uh, one part of a, as I say, of this structure. If you can imagine taking a stone and dropping it in a pond, the ripple effect that happens afterwards, this is one edge of that ripple uh, blasting its way through space because I believe it's moving at one and a half million kilometers an hour. And Hubble Space Telescope was able to photograph this over a period of years and actually watching this thing, even though it is so far away, actually watching it move through space because it is moving so fast away from that epicenter of that explosion. Again, um, I would say to people, so what do you think this is? And it kind of, yeah, looks like the North America, um, North America, so the North America nebula with, um, I'm gonna go with uh, it's Florida over here and we've got California down here. Terribly sorry if you're actually in North America and I get any of this wrong, but Mexico's down here. And I can never remember what this is called over here, the Bay of something or other. Um, but yeah, um, Bay of Mexico. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, but yes, uh, you know, so as they see it, they take a photograph and it kind of looks like sort of North America. Okay, we'll, we'll call it that. Um, but then again, this is a rich field of active hydrogen forming these new stars and intertwined with all of this dust and gas, um, which is just, you know, fab. And it, it's great doing these photographs and everything from a sort of a scientific curiosity sort of point of view, but also if, when you're creating them from an aesthetic point of view, it's the wow, it's the real wow factor whenever I, uh, I take them, you know, wow myself when I see them. Um, so. That's all done with Photoshop. All of those uh, uh, photographs were taken with Photoshop. And recently I've moved on to another piece of software called PixInsight. So I think of um, astrophotography as Formula One racing that, uh, yeah, you can do a Formula One race in a, you know, your everyday car um, and do Formula One race. And yeah, yeah, you'll get the job done. Not not in a great time, but it will, it will do it. Whereas PixInsight is basically a Formula One car. It is specifically designed for astrophotography and for no other real tasks. Um, but it's not really designed for going down to the local shop and getting bread and milk. It is only really designed for doing the task of astrophotography. And what it's allowed me to do is to take some data that I've done before and rerun it through it and come up with much better results. So again, reprocessing uh, my uh, a crescent nebula data brought out so much more detail simply because the software is designed uh, uh, to do this very task. Um, the monkey head nebula, of course it is, um, but um, the, you know, the shape of a monkey's head seen from the side is a, a, a very rich area of um, uh, new star growth from, from this, or stars being born from this uh, active 
uh, hydrogen area. Um, and everything just seems to stand out and pop out so much better and so much more than it did with um, uh, Photoshop. I reprocessed uh, my, a picture of mine that I, I took of the uh, Dumbbell Nebula. Of course, because it looks like a dumbbell uh, and it's a star that's going through um, the process of dying. It has reached the end of its life and it's turned into what we call a planetary nebula. And um, simply because I think originally when they were first discovered, it, they were thought they were planets because of the shape. Um, and essentially what we're looking at here is the central star, which is the core of that um, of the that star that has died and converted into a white dwarf that is given up a huge amount of energy and causing the rem remnants of that gas to glow. So we've got uh, the leftover hydrogen and lots of glowing oxygen here that have been picked up by these different filters. And all of these other stars in the background, this huge amount of different stars, all different colors. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was mesmerized by this when well, I was processing it in Big Um, But then I reprocessed it again because there was something I noticed about on the edges. And so this software just allows me to keep reprocessing, processing, processing to get different data. And so I found that there was these feathery sort of wings, like butterfly wings on the outside edge that were leaking away from the star that I hadn't seen before. Um, so astrophotography, it's not about something that's fixed and rigid. It's not about discovering something and then saying, okay, and let's carry on. It's not about saying, okay, we've seen that crater, or we've seen that planet, or we've found that star, and, and we can name it and monitor it and, and, and okay, and pass to go to the next thing. Astrophotography is about gathering this data, and then the next year you could gather more data, and then more data the following year and the following year, because each time you're going to reduce in the signal to noise ratio and you're going to get better results every time you add data to your data selection. So you may have 50 photographs one year, then 100 and then 150 and then 200. So these are long term projects that happen over time, revealing more and more, more results as you go along. Um, the Jellyfish Nebula, a, a uh, remnant of a supernova that happened long ago, which is this area here and uh, sort of interacting with a another area of active hydrogen between these two stars that are a part of uh, Gemini. And again, yeah, okay, kind of looks a little bit like a jellyfish, so we'll go with that. Uh, the cap of it here and the tendrils underneath. To me, it kind of looks like, if I look at it upside down, the infinity uh, glove from from the Avengers. Um, or, uh, so yeah, I kind of look at it that way and I tip my head over. Um, but yeah, I, yeah I, I, I love this one as well. Um, there is also, so the photographs that I take uh, of, of active uh, gas areas, there are a few areas that are uh, reflective. Uh, we saw that for with the Pleiades uh, M45. And this is another one, the Iris Nebula. Uh, people say they can see, yeah, the Iris shape of the flower. I can't at all. I, I, I've looked at it multiple times and gone, I just don't know how you got to that conclusion. Uh, so it is a star, a couple of stars that are deeply embedded in this rich gassy area and it's just not given off enough energy to cause this gas to glow. But you can see the gas and dust is blocking the stars behind it. And this is where the um, James Webb Space Telescope comes in handy because it can peer through this gas and dust to see stuff on the other side that we just would never see normally uh, in these types of photographs. Uh, we come on to the aptly named Christmas tree nebula because it looks like a sort of a nice Christmas tree shape and all of the lovely uh, shining baubles, et cetera, and it wrapped with tinsel and everything. Um, yeah, and, and from it for once, I'm like, yeah, okay, I can go with that. And at the top is the famous uh, Cone Nebula, which was taken, a photograph was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of these new forming stars right at the tip 
with inside this gas and dust. Um, which I, I was quite proud of this one because I was considering, you know, I was looking at the photograph and one monitor I've got of, you know, the Hubble photograph. And then looking at this one, I was going, yeah, okay, multi-billion dollar you know, space telescope and something based in Horsham with an international airport nearby costing about you know, 7,000 pounds. Yeah, that's all right. I, I'm happy with that, uh, happy with, with that result. And that just shows that with astrophotography, um, we can achieve results that, you know, are just about as good as some of the best uh, 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 sort of te telescopes uh, on Earth uh, uh, can, can do uh, and achieve. So I'm yeah, quite happy with this. So this comes on to the, um, the third part of this presentation. I was like, oh, this is all very well, but what does this all mean? To us because a lot of people see these photographs and they feel very much in awe of that it reduces them in you know and, and feels well i am very insignificant then with these distances and these sizes and ages and i am very insignificant this is the famous pale blue dot photograph taken by forger one and it is awe inspiring um taken from 3.7 billion miles in 1990 and the little pale blue dots, um, and sort of paraphrasing Carl Sagan as that everything we've ever known, every person who has lived uh, and died, every sort of event of human history, um, every book written, every song sung, every film ever made, everything that's to do with human history is on that tiny little pale blue dot, which compared to the universe around us, yeah, we do seem pretty insignificant. But there's also this other quote from R.C. Clarke, there are the two possibilities that exist. We are either alone in the universe, or we are not. Both are equally as terrifying. And I look at the, the first part of that, um, and if we are alone in the universe, that makes me feel that we are not insignificant. We are truly significant. Every single one of us on this planet, every single pair of eyes are significant. Why? Because the universe is indifferent to us on Earth. It doesn't care who, you know, what we are, who we are, uh, you know, our sex, our gender, our colour, what country we're from, what language we speak, etc. All of these things that sort of we use to separate us, the universe is indifferent to. All of these things that I've taken photographs of will occur with us looking or not. And therefore, if we are the only uh, people in the universe or only life forms in the universe, that makes us extremely significant to see these events as they, as they happen. So a bit about our future and our connection with um, the, the universe coming right back to this, this intrinsic connection. So our sun is four and a half billion years old, uh, about halfway through its age of its life cycle, um, and about another four and a half billion years, this will happen. So the inner, inner planets, not to scale obviously, but the inner planets of the solar system, the sun will reach the red giant phase. Um, and essentially, sweeping up all of these um, inner planets. So hopefully we would have figured out something you know, we would do and, and go and live somewhere else at, at that point. So we've got four and a half billion years to think about it, which is, which is quite good. Um, so looking at these, um, the, our sun and its life cycle, what it goes through. So yes, I, I, I got a U in physics. Doesn't mean I'm not sort of interest, interested in it. Um, in the same way that I'm interested in chemistry and never even studied it. But essentially, there uh, we're looking at uh, three different types of stars in when it comes to their solar mass. And um, I'm very much aware of the people who are on the call and making sure I get this, get this right. Um, so we've got stars that are uh, 1.3 solar mass. So our sun is one solar mass. Uh, 1.3 solar mass or less. So let's look at the process of how this works. So coalesces from uh, act, from active hydrogen to become 
a great big ball of of um, of uh, hydrogen uh, that is fusing to the next element up. So we saw that from earlier uh, when we were talking about the basics of the universe and you know what are stars. So we have hydrogen that is being fused into helium at a rate of around about 600 million tons a second. So every second, I can't see it now because obviously it's early in the morning, I can't see the sun, but wherever you are in the world now and there's sunlight streaming through your windows or you can see it every second that goes past, the sun is using up 600 million tons every second. And yet there is still enough to last four and a half billion years. That, that Those sort of numbers blow my mind completely. Um, and when you saw in the eclipse um, from a few days ago, and when the prominences that were coming off the sun, you know, these huge amounts of energy being given off by our star at a rate of 600 million tons a second. And so when it's consumed all of the hydrogen and ends up at helium, it still wants to maintain this shape against the forces of gravity. It doesn't want to lose, it wants to carry on going, which is, you know, perfectly okay. And then it starts to conf um, convert the helium into carbon, Car it becomes a carbon star. When it's reached carbon and it's, it, it's used all this helium up, it needs to start fusing carbon into something else to keep on going. But unfortunately, it doesn't have the energy to do that. Um, stars of this uh, mass and less, and it can't carry on the periodic table. And unfortunately, it ends up at the uh, planetary nebula stage. And it's adios, goodbye star. Uh, never mind. Um, so what about stars that are beyond 1.3 solar masses, but less than eight solar masses? Uh, this sort of sweet spot of like medium weight stars. So again, starts at hydrogen and starts to process that and fuse that into helium at a rate of more than 600 million tons a second, much more, um, but differing for different stars in depending on their solar mass. Um, and then we get the helium then starts to be fused into carbon, which is great. Okay. And then it does have the energy. You will not believe how difficult that is to do in, uh, in PowerPoint. <laughs> That's so difficult to get these arrows to move around. Um, so um, it took me a long time to figure that out. Uh, so it starts to fuse into nitrogen. So we end up with a nitrogen star, and then it starts to fuse that into oxygen. But unfortunately, at that point, it doesn't have the energy to move on to the next stages of the stellar life cycle. So planetary nebula. But what about stars that are more than eight solar masses? So again, the same story, hydrogen to helium many times more than 600 million tons uh, per second. And then we get to carbon and um, then goes on to nitrogen and nitrogen goes on to oxygen. And oxygen then can go on to silicon and then silicon can go on to iron. But unfortunately, that is it. That is it when it comes to all stars um, over you know, eight solar masses and any stars, supergiant stars, they cannot fuse iron. They cannot go beyond this stage of iron. So what happens then? We get this, this problem. So for example, we've got a 25 solar mass star and it's like the giant gobstopper. So hydrogen to helium over six times 10 to the power of six. And I'm thinking, is that six million? Or is that, yeah, that's six. Uh, seven million years so um it's consuming that because huge stars consume their energy a lot quicker or that their, their their fuel nuclear fuel a lot quicker but then the process um of uh, helium to carbon is uh, a lot quicker than that and then carbon to oxygen only lasts 600 years and then oxygen to silicon only six months and so these giant stars are using their fuel super quick and then silicon to iron only one day and then when it reaches the iron stage 
there is a core collapse. And that core collapse lasts a quarter of a second. These enormous stars that take, you know, light takes a fair amount of time to get from one side to the other because they're so big. Gravity says, hello, you remember me? Um, and then it causes us to collapse because there is no energy to keep pushing in the opposite direction and gravity crushes that star, causing an enormous explosion. So this is um, the galaxy M101 uh, uh, in Ursa Major around about uh, 16th of May 2023. And using my keyboard here, I will go backwards and forwards. See, there is a noticeable difference between the two. And some may have noticed that this bright flash down here between one day and the next. And that is the May 2023 supernova in, uh, in, in M101. This is a galaxy that's 21 and a half million light years away. That flash occurred 21 and a half million uh, years ago on a Thursday, uh, uh, back in May. So I don't even know if that works across millions of light years, but basically 21 and a half million light years ago, a star lost that titanic struggle and collapsed and caused a huge explosion that was brighter than the center of that galaxy. And this, this explosion basically shoots up the temperature of into millions of degrees Fahrenheit and centigrade. It doesn't matter at that point, it just carries on going up and causes uh, iron to then fuse and other elements to start being generated. This is the photograph I took again of the same galaxy using a hydrogen alpha filter to show these rich hydrogen alpha star forming areas and the star uh, explosion had dimmed dramatically at that point. So we come back to the Fail Nebula, this um, very important picture showing a part uh, of a death of a star where new elements were being formed in this explosion such as tin, zinc, silver, uranium, lead, gold, any gold that we're wearing, any jewelry that we have, um, oxygen in our lungs, mercury in our thermometers, carbon in, you know, in our bodies, um, hydrogen, uh, you know, hydrogen oxygen together, making water, um, nitrogen in the soil, all of these elements were formed in the heart of a supernova. All of these elements are a part of you. And um, therefore that means you, there is an intrinsic link between you and the heart of a supernova. These elements could not have occurred without a supernova, which means essentially, I think there's a well-used phrase of we are all made of stardust. We are made of stardust. These things that we are take, I take photographs of, have an intrinsic link to, to me as an individual because of the fact that I know that these elements were created and more from the supernovas and iron in our blood. Um, another major part of us is, you know, the fact that there's iron in our blood uh, is due to these, these supernovas scattering this material out into space. And this last picture, which I didn't take is of a new star forming due to such a thing that happening like that. These supernovas that then kickstart other star formation in other um, uh, areas of, of active hydrogen gas, such as the various nebula that we've seen, a new star start to form. And as they start to form, basically the, um, the parts of the leftover gas starts to clump together to form new planets. So these are new planets forming in these trails, these tracks where all these elements start to clump together and therefore that's what happened with the Earth and our, our planets in our solar system uh, billions of years ago with these elements basically under the ground that we, you know, we, we bring out and use uh, in our everyday life are just leftovers from these titanic explosions. So is there a link between what is up there and what is down here? Yes, there is. There is an intrinsic link and is 
um, I love taking photographs of those objects, knowing that I have a connection, a massive connection, like with all of us around us and everything that we have um, is linked with what is, what is up there. And with that, <laughs> I managed to get through it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Claire. That was really interesting. So, and I, I appreciate that you included the, the science behind the objects and the stars. And I personally find that knowing the, the backstory, uh, you know, increases my enjoyment of the, uh, of the images. So, so that was, that was a nice, nice touch. And I, I did get a kick out of your reference to the uh, giant gobstopper. I haven't thought about one of those in a long time. So. I don't yeah, know if they shall even make those anymore. Today's kids would know what a gobstopper is, but uh... it was the first thing that I thought of when I when when it was shown to me. It was just like, huh, looks like a gobstopper. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you image from? Do you are you in your backyard, or that, you go to? Yeah, if a lot of a lot of people say to me like, you know, do you go to somewhere really, really dark in, you know, in the UK, away from light pollution and everything like that? I'm like, no, in my back garden. So if you um, look up Google Maps, look up Horsham in um, in in the UK, it's a medium-sized town. It's about 40 miles from the centre of London, and just over there, as I say, is the uh, about. 15, 20 miles away is a massive international airport. So it produces a huge glow um, on the horizon, which is, hey, thanks. Uh, so thank God for all of the filters that I've got to be able to cut all that out. So, but it was, there's a, a cute little story of the fact that when I first found this place to, to, to live, was that uh, I was very interested in the garden because there was, it backs up onto a school playing field with no light pollution, no trees or anything like that. So when I came here and, and the estate agent was showing me around, I was like, yeah, 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 where's the garden? And I got a compass out to work out which direction north was and instantly just went, I want the place. And she said, don't you want to see the, like the bedrooms or bath? I was like, has it got bedrooms? Has it got bathroom? You know, and that's that's fine with me. I want it because of the garden to take astro photographs. Um, Where you can stop sharing. Okay. So we can see. There you go. I so didn't you see covered, any yeah. questions on here. Uh, there were some nice comments, but I didn't see any questions. Did I miss anything? No, I think oh, there were maybe a couple of questions that. Uh, Molly was answering Molly, there. Molly so. jumped questions, in. yeah. <laughs> yeah, my house is the same way. Like, I, I like the house, but um, it was the fact that I've got an empty view out for some distance. It's very dark over to the west and this big backyard with that much local light. And it's like, yes, I don't really care about the rest. This is <laughs> like the real estate agent was probably like I was explaining what my priorities were. She's probably like, okay, who's this weirdo? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's exactly what I got was that when I pulled out this this like compass to like say work out north and she was like oh do you want to work out where the sun's gonna be and whatever I was like no 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 I just want to know where Polaris is it was just like what <laughs> who, now, who I actually came back at night to come see how things looked <laughs> No word okay. of a lie. I did that with this place. I didn't want to creep out the people who lived here, but I sort of parked over there yeah. and then it was like wandering backwards and forwards, just like looking and going, I went, oh, I can really see Orion from here. <laughs> yeah. Where can I ask what you do in real life? I am a e-learning developer. Um, I create e-learning training material for um, can I name drop the company I work for? Is that allowed? Um, well, sure. I work uh, for a company called Ring Central. So it is one of these uh, companies like Zoom and um, others that we're that I am trained not to mention, <laughs> um, but like basically do the video calling and um, that sort of thing. But I I, I create e-learning material, and that is something I've done for the various other companies that I've worked for to be able to take a topic that people say. I don't really understand that. I don't think I can, or I'm qualified to and tr turn it into a way that I can so that it's, yeah, okay, I can get that. Um, 
So yeah. Well, lucky for, you, for us, you're comfortable enough with this type of format that you can do it even at 2.30, yeah. or I guess now you're at three something in the morning, but. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> but you, you, yes. we, we couldn't tell, so. And you need some <laughs> kind of you. a medal for getting up in the middle of the night or morning to, uh, Thank to do you. this. So. <laughs> we appreciate that, so. Well, I think we've covered everything, so. Molly, you're uh, running the stream tonight, right? Yeah, I will go ahead and take us out. All right. Well, thanks again, Claire. No worries. Remember, everyone, no show next week, but two weeks from now, we'll see you back here. Yep, feel free to hang out for a bit, Claire, if you if you want to, or you can just go to bed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.